Hello, hello everyone, it's Martin A.K. Anders. If you've ever asked yourself what would happen if a professional coach and Valorant strategist was allowed to design the next agent, well, let's find out. For those of you who are longtime followers of mine, you know that this isn't our first rodeo. Previously, I actually took a whack at designing a controller agent, I'll link that video in the description and up in the corner as well, and in keeping with that, there's a little bit of a structured approach to this that I like to employ. That structure involves breaking up the agent design into five primary pillars, the first of which is developing all of the fluff and background for the agent, then setting a design intent, establishing what the power fantasy for the agent is going to be, developing all of its abilities, and then finally reverse validating it against current in-game comparables. Jumping right into the first item on that list with the fluff, there's a couple different elements that we need to tackle. The first one I want to look at is the origin of the agent. Mapping out current agent origins both literally and figuratively, we get the following list. There are obviously two clear standouts in terms of underrepresentation at the moment, and going into this next year with the kickoff event for the Partnership League happening in Sao Paulo, I think that it's about time that we get another South American agent into the game. Looking at agent genders, the recent string of female agent releases like Neon and Fade has actually pushed Valorant to be a female majority game at the moment. We're going to add a male character to the list to balance that back out. And now we look at a piece of fluff that's a little bit more lore specific, and that's the comparison between Radiant and non-Radiant characters. As it stands right now, it's actually a dead 50-50, but we're going to go with Radiant because who doesn't like making magical characters, let's be honest. Quickly summarizing our fluff, that means that we have a South American male Radiant as the basis for our character. Moving on to design intent, the first thing that we need to answer is what class do we expect this agent to fill? Again, using the current game as our benchmark, we have six duelists, five initiators, five controllers, but only four sentinels, so that's what we'll try to tackle here. There's a lot more than just primary class, though, when it comes to design intent, and for that, I want to dive into another topic. Those of you familiar with my content are going to feel right at home. We're going to jump back into style dynamics. For those of you unfamiliar, Style Dynamics is the triangular balancing system that is prolific throughout gaming's history, super popular in TCGs in particular, and I have a couple videos that I'll link in the description below that summarize this concept fairly succinctly. Where we're going to be looking at designing a sentinel for the game, it's important to contextualize that agent next to their counterparts inside of their class. Where do the other sentinels fall in terms of stylistic design? For that, I simply drop them onto the Style Dynamics triangle. Sentinels in and of themselves are a very control bias agent type, and so when analyzing them, I actually go so far as to take the control subsection of the triangle and make it its own triangle. When viewing the existing Sentinels in this context, it makes things a lot clearer in terms of where the current balance of this class is. We have a highly aggressive Sentinel in Chamber, a more traditionally controlling Sentinel in Cypher, a more mid-rangey controller in Sage, and a control aggro hybrid in Killjoy. Looking at this in a vacuum, most people's knee-jerk response would be, okay, well the agent that we're designing here should either be a control mid-range hybrid or an aggro mid-range hybrid. However, I think there's something really important to discuss here that's actually very much so in line with one of the design problems that I personally have with how Harbor was slotted into the game. You see, just like not all controllers are made equal, some are orb smokers and some are wall smokers, not all sentinels are made the same. You have a category of what I like to call traditional sentinels that have passive informational tools, and then you have Sage, who doesn't. It's because of that that the character that we're going to design here, I actually want to push more towards the mid-range corner of this sub-triangle to put a traditional sentinel in that zone. In effect, balancing this sub-triangle and giving us a traditional sentinel pillar for each of the stylistic types. Now that we have a lot of the brickwork laid, we know what our agent is vaguely in terms of fluff, we know the general direction we want to go with them in terms of design, I want to jump right into developing the agent's abilities and then work backwards towards the power fantasy. This is something that I'm changing pretty distinctly from the last time that I designed an agent, 
the thought process being, I want to make sure that I'm creating abilities that aren't tainted by trying to fit a specific theme or a specific mold. I'm going to make generalized things that I think the game needs and this character needs to be balanced effectively, and then we'll work backwards until there's a theme that suits them. To that end, we have four abilities that need to be formulated. We need a passive information tool. I want a trap element with a flexible use case so that we're still very distinctly in that mid-range corner of that sub-triangle, a complementary subtype ability, and an on-theme distinctive ultimate. Starting with our passive info tool, we need this to also be distinctly mid-range. For that to happen, some of the descriptors we want to be able to apply to it are it having flexibility, reusability, or persistence. I think in our case, the latter two of those will be the best to implement. To meet those needs, the ability that I invented functions somewhat similarly to a Killjoy turret in terms of placement. It can be reversed with an alternative fire so that it's either facing away or towards you. Once placed, I imagine it being a fairly small ability, more similar in size to something like a chamber trademark as opposed to that Killjoy turret. And as far as how it gathers its passive information is where I get to start to add a little creativity. I want it to be somewhat similar to a cipher trip. Similar in that they'll both be linear beams, but also different in that this ability, I want that beam to terminate after a certain distance. Not only that, I want the mid-ranginess and the persistence of this ability to be its defining characteristic, not anything else. And because of that, I see it as being purely informational. This won't get destroyed when an enemy walks through it, instead it will make a noise and give a minimap trigger to this agent's teammates, but it will still persist. Meaning that if you can defend this device, it will be persistent information for that space throughout the entirety of the game. Instead of giving you access to true information like a reveal, or to a slow, or to a tag, or to a vulnerable, all this is doing is giving you repeated information so that you can consistently fight and refight for space exactly like Midrange wants to. Now it's important that we ask ourselves though, how are we going to fight for that space again and again? And I think the way that we want to tackle that is through the hallmark ability of a sentinel, which is a trap, in this case a flash trap. At this point though, we also have to be incredibly mindful because we are trading a very thin line between where we want to be and entering the stylistic niche of agents like Breach. To help avoid that pitfall, we want to push this flash as far as we can into our control subtype, meaning we want to look at the specific characteristics of being permissive, manipulative, and passive. Particularly, we want to look at the latter two elements there because if we do lean heavily into that permissive style, it starts becoming almost too distinctly control when we are creating a mid-range agent. For this, I imagine something placeable similar to a cipher camera, but also one that has a limited field of view, so you have to rotate it similar to a sage wall to confirm its placement. I think it's important that we include this limited FOV because if we don't, there's too high of a likelihood that this character starts abusing these placed flashes as a primary sight anchoring element, as opposed to using it for intermediate space, which is something that we want to look for more. In short, I imagine you place this ability, you spin it a little bit until you have the field of vision that you want, you lock in that field of vision, and then later in the round you can activate this for a pop flash. This trap is fundamentally sentinel-like, but it also suits our needs as a mid-range character and synergizes superbly with our first ability. You can imagine an opposing character walking into tree on ascent, turning the corner. They walk directly into one of our traps, activate the sound in the minimap signal, we pop the flash, they're blind and forced out of that space allowing us to retake it. Potentially placing more than one of these in an area allows us to even become even more pronouncedly mid-range. But now that we have this flash, how do we balance it? Here we have a list of the types, durations, and time to draw for every flash that currently exists in the game. Without rattling off all of the numbers, we see two very distinct patterns emerge. You have two major strata, which are the aggro or duelist flashes, which have a roughly 0.5 second time to draw and a slightly shorter flash duration commensurately. And then you have the more initiator focused flashes, which have longer flash durations, but a longer time to draw and are mostly teammate oriented. But we can even take that a step further, looking at two agents in particular, Ko and Sky. 
They both have two potential flash durations with two and a quarter seconds with one use and one second in an alternative use case and the longest time to draw of any flash in the game. Something I want to highlight here that may or may not have been intentional from a Riot perspective is these are also the only two agents on this list who have informational tools. These are the most distinctly informationally control agents on this list, and I think in part of that, they are given a flash that makes it significantly more difficult for them to effectively capitalize off of that information. The agent that we're creating here meets all of those same criteria. To create a bit of novelty, I think that this flash shouldn't be a flash, and it should actually be a near sight. I think its primary duration should be dropped down to two seconds. We're still not talking about an initiator here, so I don't think we want to push it too far over the edge. I do, however, think that it needs to have a secondary fire, and we'll discuss in large part why I believe that is later on when we look at the rest of the abilities. And I think we should be looking at that maximum time to draw of 0.85 seconds. This gives us a great blend of mid-range and control, which is exactly the niche that we want to be in. Touching briefly on the mechanics of that secondary fire though, I want to introduce the first pop near sight in the game. Comparing it to something like Neon's Relay Bolt, I think the initial impact should be the catalyst for it popping and creating the near sight. This would be extremely short duration, and it will give this agent something to do on attack, where the majority of their kit up until now is looking predominantly at placements. This allows them to play the game on attack other than just simply sitting and wait. Moving to the third skill in the kit, we want a complementary ability that doesn't look at the agent's complementary type necessarily, but rather their complementary class. Every agent has a subclass in one way or another, and ours is subtype initiator. Going through the potential options of initiator abilities, you have things like entry by proxy, team-oriented flashes, active information tools, and pop damage. Thinking of entry by proxy, I immediately crossed that off the list. That is way too strong to give a sentinel. I'll be completely honest. I think that if we were to give that to this character, it would be so far off the deep end, it wouldn't even be funny. We're also going to cross out a team-oriented flash because, well, we basically already have it. And then we look at active information tools. This, again, I think almost is in the realm of that entry by proxy where we don't want this to just be an information engine. We don't want it to encroach on Cypher's territory, so that's also going to fall off of our list. That leaves us with one thing, pop damage. This works out great because pop damage in and of itself is almost exclusively mid-rangey in nature, but we're going to add some sentinel flavor and control subtype to that by adding a bit of stall to it. Similar to our flash, we do have to tread a little bit lightly here though because we are directly adjacent to a number of agents. You're talking about Astra's Nova Pulse, Breach's Aftershock, Sova's Shock Darts, and Raze's Paint Shell. We're trying to find something that's sort of in between and amongst all of these, but still distinct and unique. In order to capture that, I'm going the route of Astra's general kit design, where I want this to be a multimodal agent. The thing that we placed before for our flashes can be alternatively activated for this ability. Knowing that we want to take that route, I also love the general design behind Breach's Aftershock. It's a fundamentally space-taking ability that's meant for zone denial, but by staggering the explosions, they add an element of stall and controlly nature to it. I want to do something similar, but slightly different. We're going to introduce that stalling controlling element by making it last a small amount of time, but instead of having it being a multi-pulse or multi-pop piece of pop damage, you would have your placed ability similar to the flash, and it would likely have a much tighter cone than the original ability just to make it a little bit more balanced. And upon activation, it would project out a conical vulnerable and short duration molly effect that ticks for something like 25 damage per second. Not enough to kill you, but enough to make you want to move and vulnerable you, allowing us to counter swing and fight for that space as a mid-range agent would want. And that brings us, at long last, to the ultimate, which has to be a distinctive and thematic ultimate at its core. For that, we have to think about what our agent has sort of become throughout this process thus far. It's an anchor specialized in holding intermediate space. It is fundamentally supportive in most cases, using those flashes to oftentimes get teammates back into those intermediate spaces and contest them repeatedly. It is a mid-range primary type and a control subtype. 
But that still doesn't help us with debatably the most important thing here, which is that it needs to be thematic. So now, let's figure out what the theme of this agent is. We have an origin for them, a gender, we know that they're radiant, we know what their abilities are generally going to look like, but what theme do these abilities fit into in a logical way? The easiest place to start is what flash sources exist. Obviously, you've got explosions and you've got light. But we can cross explosions right off the list because we've already got classic militaristic style flashes, we've got literal explosive flashes with breach. Looking at light further, we can really start brainstorming a more firm direction. What are the interesting nuances of light that could make for something distinct and thematic? You have focused light and lasers by extension, refraction, diffusion, dispersion, and prisms. That last one is what caught my eye. You see, with prisms, we're no longer just talking about light, we're talking about glass. And as I'm sure you can tell by the name of the video, glass is the direction that we went. Now, just normal glass is fairly trite though. That's, that's something that's been done a hundred times. So let's start brainstorming even deeper with glass as a subconcept. Where are the natural sources for glass? You have the glass that's naturally formed by lightning called fulgurites. That's pretty interesting. That's definitely a direction we could go. It's global. It would be able to fit our origin. Then you have meteorite formed glass, which is equally global, but has a very distinct link to the Libyan desert. And then you have the black volcanic glass of obsidian. This, this is where my mind really started racing. You see, for those of you who aren't aware, Chile has 30 active volcanoes. As a matter of fact, the volcanic fields in central Chile are one of the largest sources of obsidian globally. This is where the creativity really just took off. I started to spin this story in my mind of Glass, a Chilean volcanologist working an active site like Chai Ten during First Light, the lore event that signaled the emergence of the First Radiance. In the months following First Light, his arms would turn a sandy course, then a glossy sheen, and finally the charcoal black of the obsidian of the fields where he was working. Before long, his entire torso would be consumed by the glassy substance. But this wasn't just any obsidian. This was radionite-infused obsidian, something that was fundamentally twisted by the First Light. And through trial and error, Glass would find he could not only control the obsidian, but catalyze the radionite within it, creating brilliant bursts of energy, but also consuming all the impurities that gave the obsidian its characteristic blackened tone. Every time, what was left behind was immaculately pristine prismatic glass. But I'm no lore master, nor a storyteller, so I will stop it there. I imagine Glass's upper body partially or mostly obsidian and glass. In fact, I went so far as to assume that one arm should be clear glass and the rest of the torso should be obsidian. This intentionally splits his aesthetic and it emphasizes the modality and mid-range nature of the character far beyond just his kit. And the latter part of that origin story gives us the core of this kit. He can catalyze his obsidian. By purifying it, he essentially creates perfect prisms and bursts of light, a great source for his flash, and he can also create volcanic levels of heat and pressure, the natural source of that obsidian in the first place. Now the train is well and truly full steam ahead, let's lay out his entire kit thus far with this new theme. First, we have Focus, that passive information tool which will have two charges and cost 100 credits each. When you use this ability, you equip a trap with a focusing lens of Glass's obsidian. You primary fire to place the destructible trap, creating a beam of prismatic light terminating after a short distance. Enemy players who cross and disrupt the flow of that light cause the trap to emit a sound and give a minimap warning. You can secondary fire to reverse the direction of the trap prior to placement. Personally, I love the direction that this ability took, transforming from just a basic tripwire to something that's fundamentally embedded with the core identity of Glass. Not only that, but he's now one of the few characters that actively blends technology, the trap itself, with something that is radiant in nature, his obsidian. We have radionite artifacts as well as radionite powered technology, but few things that are as directly a marriage as this. 
we're going to jump down to the first half of his ultimate. Again, think back to Astro. We are partitioning this. She has Astral Form so that she can play stars, and then Cosmic Divide so that she can have a traditional ultimate. Glass will function under a fairly similar system. Extrude, his signature ability, will have two charges with an additional free charge, so three in total, and each charge will cost 150. Once activated, Glass will extrude a shard of Radionite Infused Obsidian. He can primary fire to embed that shard, and primary fire a second time to set the shard's direction. Next, we have Disperse, Glass's Flash. This will be a two-charge ability with a third on an internal cooldown of 35 seconds. This will cost zero because it is consuming shards, again very similar to Astra's stars, and the duration of the flash will be two seconds at base with an alternative fire of one second. When used, you can activate a shard to catalyze its Radiantite content, purifying it into a prism. In a cone in front of that shard, enemies are nearsighted, excluding the area of the shard itself. This is destructible, think Rainalier. Alternatively, you can activate it while extruding to quickly launch a shard forward. It immediately catalyzes when it contacts the surface, shattering into refractive dust and causing a short nearsight. Next, we have Liquify, which will be a single charge, zero cost ability with a duration of three seconds and 25 damage per second with a two second vulnerable attached. When used, you'll activate a shard to destabilize its Radiantite content, causing it to superheat and spray forward an arc of Molten Obsidian. The lingering area of lava deals damage and applies a vulnerable. And at this point, we have come full circle. We've got our agent design almost down to a T, but we're back to that thematic ultimate. For this, I think that we have a ton of interesting design space to play with. We've got volcanic themes, glass themes, light themes, obsidian themes, so much that we can potentially tease out. And so instead of looking into that realm, I asked myself, stylistically, what does this agent want? It's generally going to look to anchor, but it's using its abilities to, instead of contesting sites, contest the intermediate spaces that precede those. This ultimate should be that last ditch effort. It should be a true anchoring ability that allows them to say, okay, I've expended my entire kit and they're still about to hit this site. This is where we stand our ground. And this would be really, really controlly, generally speaking, but I think I'm okay with that. Again, this is a primary mid-range secondary control agent, so it's not their primary type. It's definitely not a mid-range ability. But if we look at a lot of agents, their secondary typing is very often what their ultimate is aligned with. It's something that you have very limited access to, so it's complementary by nature and thus lends itself very well to that secondary typing. This being extremely controlly fits this agent perfectly. The ability that I came up for this, I called Hyaloclasm. Hyalo being the Greek prefix for glass and clasm being to destroy. At 7 pips, you would equip Extrude and then secondary fire to catalyze all of the obsidian in Glass's body, in effect becoming a human prism. The surge of energy creates a localized pyroclasm, applying vulnerable to enemies in an arc in front of him, and the generated light passing through Glass nearsights all enemies who look at him, excluding the area of his own body for a short time. You become the Flash. Now at first glance, you might look at this ability and say, hold up, that's an initiating ability that sounds more like a breach ultimate than something that you would use for anchor. And I think the crux of that is how big of an arc we're talking about. Not only that, but a person who is a flash doesn't want to be running through a bottleneck. It is a fundamentally anchoring biased use case. Let's overhead view Ascent A site. Let's say that I, as the glass, have fought treat and also probably used one of my shards as a disperse to contest a main. Nonetheless, I've been forced to play back dice and they are going to hit my site. Fortunately, because both I and my teammates have been effectively playing off my kit thus far, we are strong side A. We've been contesting these spaces of tree and a main repeatedly throughout the round, playing as a mid-range team, and because of that, we are very much so ready to support the glass. As the sight hit comes in, Glass activates Hyaloclasm. The arc in front of him is extremely limited and is mostly targeted at counter-execute. It's not even as long as an Omen's Paranoia. 
But then comes the fun part, the glass becomes a flash. He can swing out from dice and contest the inflow of opponents, but as we mentioned, he's completely visible to them. The flash does not apply to him himself, so where is the value in this? We're gonna go back to the fact that he is a supportive agent in nature. Think about all of the angles and the counter swings that my teammates can now take completely zero risk because of the fact that they're already rotated in, we've played our mid-range composition effectively, and I am being supportive in the way that I need to be. My kid is gone. I've served my use. In my worst case scenario where I turn this corner and I die, me being traded is already my best case scenario. I just have an ability now that enables me to fulfill that duty to the utmost. We've created a style lined agent that when played to the absolute pinnacle by both the glass player and their teammates, it gets rewarded by transmuting a completely worst case scenario into a best case scenario. I guess in summary, I hope you all realize how much of a blast I had doing this. Uh, I think that in my last agent design, I put a lot of time and effort into making sure that I min max the kit design in terms of like, oh, should I get into the minutia of the numbers and like make sure that everything is ultra balanced and perfect. And in this one, I took almost the opposite approach in that I explored a lot more design space and just concepts for abilities like th there's no way for me to tell whether or not focus the tripwire in this kit is going to be broken or not broken it doesn't have a duration there's no real balance levers that are comparable other than like maybe the overall distance that the the beam of light itself covers so that is purely me working off of intuition and saying okay i want to make a mid-range agent I need to create something that's going to be persistent information so I can capitalize off of it with my flash and retake space repeatedly throughout a round to introduce that dynamism that exemplifies me as a mid-range agent. Super rabbit holy stuff that honestly I just enjoy a lot more because there's a lot more freedom of thought when you're approaching it that way. I'd love to hear down in the comments below, what are people's thoughts on this agent? If Glass was in the game, would you play him? Would you not play him? Would you hate him? Would you love him? I think that I obviously have an extreme bias. Being a professional coach, I'm like, oh, this agent would absolutely slap, but he requires a ton of coordination. He's an agent that I think requires very sound macro strategy from a team. He's also very uh, supportive in that you need teams capitalizing off of these flashes a lot of the time. The time to draw and disperse means that Glass is not going to be just like yeeting himself at opponents as soon as they come into a corridor or trigger his focus. He's not going to be like, disperse, swing you, kill you. He has enough of a delay that he is still playing a pseudo initiative role. And I think that is a very important balancing element to his kit. Like I said, please give me your thoughts down below. I absolutely love this. I love the thought process of designing not only the agent itself, but I think all of his sub themes were genuinely compelling. The fact that I went from glass to prisms to obsidian which is black glass and then finding a way back to clear glass i thought was pretty creative and something that i'm sort of uniquely proud of a lot of the stuff that i typically take pride in is like very results oriented and this is something where i'm like wow creativity wise i'm actually super hyped about this so hit me with your best hit me with your worst love to hear your thoughts and i hope you enjoyed this process of developing glass before we go, a couple items of housekeeping. First and foremost, I have a Discord now. That'll be linked down in the description below. There's already a couple integrations that I have set up for YouTube members, Twitch subscribers, Patreon supporters that will give you access to content previews, content polls, and Ask Anders channel, and just a home to discuss with very theoretically inclined individuals in the Valorant scene. And in addition to that, of course, I have to thank all of my members, which heard the usual I guess now I'm gonna have to read them because after rambling about glass for 35 45 minutes I can't remember six names off the top of my head so thank you Spencer's me one crampy golden fury hick messiah and Colin Torbus you're all the goats and as always thank you so much for watching I'll see you in the next one and I know I baited you all with like a silhouette on the thumbnail I'm sorry that doesn't actually exist I literally threw that together by piecemealing like astra arms and harbor body and like manipulating them and stretching them until i thought it was believable if you want to put together a, con a concept art for this agent go right ahead i will applaud you for it but i'm not that artistic i'm sorry